Oh, thank you. Uh, before I started tonight, uh, Mike came up to me and I said, how are you doing? He said, up and down. I thought, boy, that sure does fit the message tonight. I said, I need to call this message tonight up and down. And the verses that hurt us so bad, that causes us to go up and down. I'm going to talk about Peter and his life and how up and down he was. And that Peter is probably the best example that we have in the Bible that we wrestle with because Peter was a common, simple man. He was a fisherman from Galilee. He, what Peter did, he and James and John, uh, the sons of Zebedee, they would go out on this Sea of Galilee and they would throw out a net and they would fish. They didn't take a one, uh, one pole and put a hook on it and put a worm on it. That's not how they fished. Hi. <laughs> And they would fish, and they would pull in the fish and throw away the bad ones and keep the good ones. You remember there was one place there Jesus said, throw your, I believe it's in the fifth chapter of Luke, he said, throw your net on the other side of the boat. I found out that from a distance, it was more than a miracle. It was, but they said, we're not catching anything. He said, throw it on the other side of the boat. When you stand off at a distance on the Sea of Galilee, you can see fish just below the surface. And he said, throw it on the other side of the boat, and it was so heavy, they had a hard time pulling it in. And Peter, at another time, in John, the last chapter of John, the 21st chapter, he threw the net in, and he could not drag it in. And that word drag is the word helco. It's the same word that Jesus used when he said, no man can come to me except my Father which has sent me draw him. The word is helco. It's the same word Peter used, or Jesus used, when Peter was out there fishing and he drug in the fish. Well, God has to drag us in, change our will into his righteous will. Now, there are some verses, and I talk to people about them all the time. I don't necessarily start witnessing to somebody about predestination. Sometimes I do. I think the hardest verses to tell people are the verses I'm going to give you, and I've given them to you nearly every service. So whenever you say these kinds of words uh, over here in, let's just look at some of them, and you've heard me say them so many times over and over in John, uh, no, excuse me, Luke, Luke 14. And this is what this is saying. Let me make it real plain. I, I want to make it plainer than I ever have. And this is a verse that I will use uh, in Luke 14. There's a man giving a wedding supper for... Uh, his friends and many of them make excuse and say I can't come I've married a wife one says I bought five yoke of oxen my wife won't let me come and I bought a new lawnmower and I've got to try it out on Sunday and another one says uh, uh, he's made they all begin to make excuse and the first one said I have bought a piece of ground and I got to apply it and look at it on Sunday and then when you get down here to what Jesus says in verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, after they made these excuses, he said, If any man come to me and hate not his father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You cannot be a mathetes, a follower of Christ. 
He cannot be a learner. That's what a disciple is unless he hates everything in his mother that's an excuse or his father, his brothers and sisters. I don't go around, I didn't go around my father and mother. They did not like this message I preach. They did not like Christmas being pagan. My mother told me one time, if you don't stop talking to me, Jimmy, about that predestination, I'm going to ask you to get out of, a, out of the car and walk. I'm not going to have that around me. She was a gentle, quiet person, but she hated predestination. And she died here last year at 99 years old. I don't know where she went. She claimed to be a Christian. She never cussed. She never drank. She never told dirty jokes. She was gentle and quiet until you got to predestination. And she had a tremendous resentment towards that. Then he says, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, I got to put another verse with this. The Bible says faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word substance, hypostasis, hupo means under, stasis means to stand. And the Bible says in Romans 3, 10, 11, and 12, there's none that understandeth, none seeketh after God. So if you have an understanding, God has to put that in your heart. Well, if you understand, you are a learner. A learner, you're a disciple because you're going to do what he says and you cannot obey God unless he puts it into your heart. And the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hear and obey are your basic same word in the Greek. Now, I've said this to people. I'll say, Jesus said, He that beareth not his cross and cometh after me cannot be my follower. He can't learn from me. If he can't learn, he certainly won't obey me. And the Bible says Jesus is coming back to take vengeance on all those that know not God, that obey not the gospel. And Peter said, uh, Paul said in Galatians 3 and 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, you should not obey the truth. If you think you don't have to obey, but you cannot obey what you cannot learn and be a learner, and you have to have a daily cross. If you do not, I told my dentist the other day, I said, you cannot go to heaven without a daily cross. You can't get there, Billy. And he just goes, he's got a real innocent looking face. He looks real young for 60 years old. He looks like he's 45. He's real young looking. And he just said, oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, and I tell people this, and this hurts them. You can't go to heaven without a daily cross. And if you have a daily cross, you have to be condemned to it. In the first century, a daily cross is not, it is not being behind on your bills. It's being crucified for what's being said. You cannot go to heaven without a daily cross because you cannot be a learner and a follower of Christ, he said, you can't be my disciple and learn from me and obey me without a daily cross. Daily crosses are for crucifying. And in the first century, you had to be a slave or a criminal to suffer a daily cross. If you're a Roman citizen, they could not put you on a cross. That was against the law. Jesus was crucified for being a criminal. They said he blasphemed God, and it was the laws of the Pharisees. They ran the land. The Romans, they are under the rule of the Romans, but the Pharisees were the law of the land. The, the Romans didn't care what kind of laws they passed. That's why they took Jesus to Pilate and said, crucify him. So, you cannot go to heaven without a daily cross. Somewhere in your life, people have to want to crucify you for your words. All of the apostles died a martyr's death. Most of your 
most of your prophets in the Old Testament died a martyr's death. There's a book here called Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it will tell you in the front of the book just how the apostles died. Let me see if I can open up to it. Just listen to a couple of these. Stephen died. Of course, he was stoned to death. Uh, he was the first martyr of the church. James the Great, the next martyr we meet, with, uh, with according to St. Luke in the history of the apostles' acts, was James, the son of Debedee, the elder brother of John and a relative of our Lord, for his mother Salome was cousin German to the Virgin Mary. It was not until ten years after the death of Stephen that the second martyrdom took place, for no sooner had Herod Agrippa been appointed governor of Judea than with a view of ingratiating himself with them, he raised a sharp persecution against the Christians, and this is when that James was put to death. Philip was born at Bethsaida in Galilee and was first called by the name of Disciple. He labored diligently in Upper Asia and suffered martyrdom at Heliopolis in Phrygia. Phrygia is just right up. This is where Philip was put to death. See here. Phrygia is right up in here, right in that area. That's where he died. That was Philip. Matthew, his occupation was a tax collector. He was born at Nazareth. He wrote his gospel in Hebrew, which was afterwards translated into the Greek by James the Less. Now, that's an opinion. The scene of his labors was Parthia in Ethiopia. He suffered martyrdom being slain with a halberd, that's a, like a billy club, in the city of Nadaba. James the Less. I suppose by some to have been the brother of the, our Lord by a former wife of Joseph. He was elected on the oversight of the churches of Jerusalem. He is the one that was the head of the council at Jerusalem in Acts the 15th chapter and was the author of the epistle ascribed to James in the sacred canon at the age of 94. He was beaten and stoned by the Jews and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Now, this is what a daily cross is about. Matthias, that's the last one that was chosen upon the death of Judas in the Acts, the first chapter, of whom less is known that of most of the other disciples was elected to fill the vacant place of Judas. He was stoned at Jerusalem and then beheaded. Talking about the apostles that followed Jesus. Andrew was the brother of Peter. He preached the gospel. In fact, he's the one that told Peter that he had found the Messiah. When he said that, Nathaniel said, Where is he from? And he said, From Nazareth. And Nathaniel said, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That's the most filthy place in the world. And Jesus said, I heard what you said. And he said, Behold a man in whom is no guile. Nathaniel will tell you the truth. And Andrew but his arrival at Edessa was taken and crucified on a cross. The two ends, which were fixed tra transversely in the ground, and hence the derivation of the term St. Andrew's Cross, just like that. It's what he was crucified on. Mark. John Mark wasn't a disciple, even though he wrote one of the Gospels. He was said to be the first man to write one of the Gospels. Was born of Jewish parents of the tribe of Levi. He is supposed to have been converted to Christianity by Peter, whom he served as amanuensis under and under whose inspection he wrote his gospel in the Greek language. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria at the great solemnity of Serapis, their idol, ending his life un under their merciless hands. Peter. We know that Peter said, I am not worthy to be crucified as my Lord. He was crucified upside down. I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's long. Paul, what it's, tradition says he was beheaded there at Rome. When he said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content, he was in a Roman jail waiting to be beheaded when he said that. That word content, autarkes, A-U-T-A-R-K-E-S. 
S. It comes from auto, which is the word self, and archaeo, meaning to push away or drive self away. He said, now since I've driven self away there in Philippians 4 and 11, I've learned to be content. I'm ready to die when he said that. The brother, Jude, the brother of James, was com commonly called Thaddeus. He was crucified at Edessa, A.D. 72. Bartholomew, also known as Nathaniel, preached in several countries, having translated the gospel of Matthew into the language of India. He propagated it in that country. He was, the, he was at length cruelly beaten and then crucified by the impatient idolaters. We're talking about the apostles of Christ. Thomas, called Didymus, preached the gospel in Parthia and India, where, exciting the rage of the pagan priest, he was martyred by being thrust through with a spear. Luke, the evangelist, he, was, he wasn't one of the apostles. He was a Gentile, and he was a doctor, as they called him in that day and time. The evangelist was Arthur of the gospel, which goes under his name. He traveled with Paul through various countries and is supposed to have been hanged on an olive tree by the idolatrous priests of Greece. Simon, surnamed Zelotes, preached the gospel in Mar Maritan Mauritania, Africa, and even in Britain, in which later, latter country he was crucified, A.D. 74. John, the beloved disciple, was brother to James the Great, the churches of Smyrna, Pergamos, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and Thyatira were founded by him. From Ephesus, he was ordered to be sent to Rome, where it is affirmed he was cast into a cauldron of boiling oil. He escaped by a miracle without injury. Domitian, which was the, one of the barbaric Caesars at that time, afterwards banished him to the Isle of Patmos, where he wrote the book of Revelation, Nerva, the successor of Domitian, recalled him. It says he was the only apostle that escaped death here in this book, but I don't believe that's true because Jesus said to James and John, Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with there in Mark 10? And they said, Yes, we can. He said, Both of you will drink the cup and you'll be baptized with this baptism, which meant a death. In the old ancient church fathers said he did die the martyr's death most people don't say that but i believe he did barnabas was of cyprus of jewish descent his death is supposed to have taken place around a.d 73 and yet notwithstanding all these continual persecutions horrible punishments the the church daily increased deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and men of apostolic and water plentifully by the blood of the saints. He died the martyr's death. They all died the death. And it goes into all of these people in the early church in the Middle Ages that were died, and they were made martyrs by the Roman Catholic Church and by the pagans. Now, let me give you some other verses with this. We have to suffer for Christ. You can, there's no getting out of it. You cannot be a disciple. One more verse here in this 14th chapter, verse 32. Excuse me, verse 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. What do you mean? You have to give it all away? No, you cannot think about you in your thoughts about the things you have. I know what that's like. I used to just think about me and my success for year after year decade after decade i don't care about that anymore i don't care about the things i have if you want what i've got you want my shoes you can wear them you can have them that's where i am i have never been at this place until i hit somewhere around 65 and the older i get i don't have that much longer to live at 78 maybe 11 or 12 years in 11 years i'll be 90. You don't live past 90. Most people don't live past, most men don't live past 84 or 85. That gives me six and a half years to live if I die the way other men die. Maybe I'll live longer since I don't fret anymore and I believe that God's doing everything. 
He that forsaketh not all he had. You have to come to a place where you're not concerned of what you have and what you don't have. You got to give it up in your mind where it doesn't mean anything. If somebody burns my house down, I'm going to say, look at that. It's burnt down. Where can I sit down? You say, you won't do that. Yes, I will. I'm at that place now. You won't get there till you get older. It's more fun to live life not fretting over what you have and what you don't. Because if you have a lot, like Bill Gates, he's going to have his 70 to $75 billion for another 12 to 15 years, and then he's going to be dead, and it's going to belong to somebody else. How would you like to have $70 billion knowing that you only got five years to live, and when five years is up, it's going to be spread among all of your relatives, and they're going to be fighting over it in court. How would you like that as a legacy? He that forsaketh all that he hath cannot be my disciple. Things don't matter. If we think about each other, and look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Let me give you another verse. Over here in Luke 9, this is a verse I use all the time. Luke 9, verse 23, this is one of the most serious verses in the Bible. It, it will convict and cut to a man's heart be, before predestination, before you tell somebody Christmas is pagan. Christmas is pagan. Predestination is true, and God's got an elect family. There is no verse in the Bible that's stronger than this because of the mainly because of the parsing of the words. 9.23. We're going to give you some parsing on the words. 9.23. And Jesus said to them all, If, not if, it's not in the text, any man will come after me, let him deny himself. I told my dentist that the other day. I said, you, I said to him, I said, I was talking to him about some men I knew in this town that were very devious and underhead in real estate, and he knew a lot of their names. He knew who they were. I said, but I said, what they have in them is common to all men. We all have evil in us. And there's none of us that seek after God. I told him that. And I said to him, I said, we all, there's no temptation taken one man, but such is not common to all men. And he said to me, we all have issues, don't we? I said, no, I don't call it issues. I call it sin. And he said, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, he kind of backed up. I said, it's sin. We all have it. And I said, we have to repent of it. I'm going to give him this verse next time I go in. i got to go in about two months. If any man will come after me, deny self. Let him deny self and take up his cross. This is one of the hardest verses in the Bible. This is a lot harder than telling a man about predestination. Let him... Deny self, take up cross, follow me. This word deny, the word take, the word follow, in the Greek text, they are called imperative moods. The word deny, I looked at my dentist and I said, sin, I said, would you like me to tell you what sin is? I said, it is self. And that took him back. He said, well, I don't know what self you got to eat. I said, I didn't say you didn't have to eat. You got to get self out of your mind and think of others and God and not yourself. The Bible says we need to look on the wealth of others and not our own. Make sure they're taken care of. That's what Paul said. Deny is the word up or naomi. T 
take is the word A-I-R-O. Arrow means to lift up in the air. Lift up in the air. We probably get our word A-R-R-O-W. Arrow, it's pronounced the same way. Aparneomai comes from arneomai. Arneomai which is the word contradict. You have to contradict yourself. But apo means completely. You have to have a complete contradiction of self, which means every day, and take up your cross daily. And the only way you get a cross is by being condemned to it, and people want to crucify you, how do they crucify you? They separate from you. Remember, death is not a word that means to be annihilated. Doesn't mean that. Thanos. Thanatos. Two ways to spell it. It means, it does not mean annihilation it means separation when people start separating from you because you talk to them about christmas they're going to crucify you next time they see you in the marketplace they will say hi i have to go now and when they used to be friendly they're not going to like you you have to be hated by the world in order to go to heaven you have to have a cross in order to go to heaven somewhere along the way every one of god's children are going to suffer a cross you're going to say something to somebody along the way. We don't do Christmas anymore. We found out it's pagan. We found out that predestination is true and that God does not love everybody. When you say those words, you don't have to sound mean. I didn't sound mean to my dentist the other day. I just talked to him real gentle, real quiet. I see you have to have, I said it quiet. I'm talking to you louder than I was him so you can hear me. I said, you have to have a daily cross in order to go to heaven. You cannot go to heaven without one. Nobody's going to heaven without a daily cross. Nobody. Boy, that puts a load on your shoulders, doesn't it? Somewhere along the way, people got to get mad at you. The verse that I've never heard any preacher talk about is over there in John. In John... Well, I didn't finish this. Follow means to, it is the word A-K-O-U-L-A-T-H-E-O. Akulatheo means to be in the same way with. And this doesn't just include us. It includes all those apostles with Christ. We have to be in the way with Christ. There is no other way to heaven. You're not going if you're not in the narrow way. The narrow way is an extremely difficult way. There is a broad way. I told my dentist the other day, I said, most people that die are going to hell. I said, there's a narrow way and a broad way, and the Bible says only few find the narrow way. That's a heavy load on us and our responsibility, isn't it? We have to have a narrow way somewhere in our life. Narrow is the word thalibo, T H. L-I-B-O, it is the verb form of T-H-L-I-P-S-I-S. Thalipsis is the common Greek word for tribulation. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. And Paul wasn't saying that just off the cuff or off the, just to, to be having to fill in place in the Bible. He was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra, he was stoned and left for dead outside of Lystra here in the middle of Turkey when he was preaching at Lystra and they wanted to kill him for what he was saying. 
So he says after they stoned him, threw him off of a cliff, he looked like he'd been in a severe camel wreck. These are verses that you can't go wrong on when you witness somebody. And they don't know what to do with these. They'll argue about predestination. They'll argue about Christmas. They won't argue about a daily cross. That's what the Bible says. They really won't argue about the tribulation way. They'll look at you and go, like, it's frightening to them, and it is. It might be frightening to you, is it? Is this a heavy responsibility on us? It's not something you'll have to try to do. It's something God will put in your heart, and you'll get fed up with you, and it may take you years to learn to carry that cross, but if you're elect somewhere in your life, people are going to condemn you, and they're going to want to kill you, and you're going to be in the narrow way, and only a few people are going to heaven. Few, not many. And then there's a broad way that leads to destruction, and many are going in that. Many. Every time you find tribulation in the Bible, it is this word, the same word as narrow, thalibo. And that's the truth. And no one other verse. And then I'm going to go to Peter. We're going to spend some time on Peter. Peter struggled with these verses, the concept of them, because, boy, he was up one day and he was down the next. Half the time he's correcting Jesus. Then when he gets to Pentecost, he stands up and tells all these men the truth. And sometimes he'd spend time in jail for telling the truth. And other times he'd comp compromising and trying to pull away from the Gentiles because it had been the custom of the Jews not to eat with them all through the Old Testament. Peter had his foot up into his mouth, up to his knee most of the time. He had the cleanest leg in town. He had a hard time with this right here. Real difficult time. But Peter was a fisherman, a common working man from Galilee. Paul had been a killer, a murderer. He said, I made havoc of the church. The word phonos means murderer. He killed Christians for a living. When Paul started taking a stand for Christ, if you take some old, some old bike rider that rides with the hell's angels and they get in fights every night and they take drugs and they drink and get drunk, God deals with their heart. He changes them. We've got a fellow in the church like that. He changes them that where they won't back up on anything. They may be hard on people, sometimes harder than they need to be, but they have to learn to back off. That takes a long time to learn that also. It takes a hard time learning that you have to have a daily cross. You have to have a daily cross. You can't go to heaven without it. And it depends on what God does in your life as to when you'll start bearing it. You'll start talking to people somewhere in your life. You know what you'll get tired of? You'll get tired of you. You say, I'm tired of trying to figure this thing out. I'm just going to tell everybody all the truth all the time. That's what happened to me. I used to not be this pointed and this straight. I was always blunt. But I didn't approach all the things that hurt the believers. Well, these don't hurt you. They give you strength. The more these Greek words you learn, the more truth you learn, the more you can stand. That's what I keep trying to tell people. Jim, I have a hard time standing. I know what you're unlearned. I can't tell one of these kids to go out here and take your cross and die daily. Even though she goes to school and takes DVDs to school and they give her a hard time about it. <laughs> She's always saying, I want to give somebody DVDs. Well, if she keeps doing that as she gets older, you become real strong after years. It doesn't, it bothered me at 35, not to talk about the Bible, but to get real blunt about it with people. I talk about the Bible, but I couldn't get as blunt as I needed to. Now I'll get blunt with anybody, but I won't be mad. I'll talk to my dentist, my orthodontist, and my, I talked to the orthodontist one day he said, I like your shirts. I said, you actually like these? 
He said, yeah. I said, this is God does not love everybody. He said, I know. <laughs> who can, who knows? I've got an appointment with him here in oh, a few weeks, and I'll tell him the truth again. So why don't you do something about it? And then the other verse. I'm showing you these verses so I can point out to you why Peter said had such a hard time standing all the time. He was up and down and up and down. He had he the longest day he lived, he struggled with whether he should separate from Gentiles. And Paul said, well, you're a missionary to the Jews, and I'm a missionary to the Gentiles, but you need to preach to the Gentiles. And he preached to Cornelius at the house of Cornelius. You'd think he'd already figured that out, but then you get to Galatians, the second chapter, and he sees Paul coming with some Jews, and he was eating with some Gentiles, and he pulled away from them. It's like, Peter, you're the guy that went to the house of Cornelius and God, God said, kill and eat, and I've cleansed all things and all men. That was something that was, you know what he had? He had some of the things that you and I have. He had some theology buried in his heart that he had a hard time getting it out, even though Jesus Christ himself came and talked to him when he saw him on the road there and told him to go to the house of Cornelius. Sometimes it's real difficult of getting these things out of your heart. I'm going to tell you what's wrong with a lot of Christians. They think they respect people more than they should. They look up to them. Well, this is a banker. He drinks iniquity like water like the rest of us. Well, this is a lawyer. <laughs> you think he's special? He's not. They cuss behind the scenes. They drink behind the scenes. And they look real respectable when they put on their suits and come to their office. They're not what you think. I'm old. I know that. I've been behind the scenes and watched them mess around on their wives and watch real estate uh, moguls mess around and get, un and get dishonest and cheat and steal and do it in a real smooth way where they look good. The world is filled with people that drink iniquity like water. That's every human being you run across out there. Every one of them. That's what I told the dentist. I said, we all are made of the same stuff. He said, we all have issues. I said, no, it's sin. And he didn't know what to do with that. I know he won't mind me telling you these things because I like the guy. I hope God will deal with his heart one day. Then over here in John 15... The verses that you hear me always say, I never heard a preacher dwell on these verses. John 15. You can tell people this out in public. John 15 and verse 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Well, it gets more emphatic as we read down here. If you are of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore, here's an emphatic statement, the world hates you. You have to be hated by the world. They're not going to like you pulling the cover off of their sin. Well, he says that later in this chapter. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. You're no better than me. They hate me. You're not better than me. If they have persecuted me, me, they will also persecute you. Did they persecute Jesus? Yes, they did. They killed him. If they have kept my things, they will keep yours. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto these Pharisees, they had not had sin, but now they have nothing to cover up their sin with. I've pulled the cover off, and they're sinners, and they were the most respected men in Israel. That's what the Pharisees were. People looked at them like a bunch of Baptist preachers with three-piece suits on. They weren't, they talked very soft and very gentle until Jesus said, you snakes. And they went, we'll kill you. They weren't always snarling. 
Now, this is what Peter wrestled with. Just the same thing. I have people come up to me sometimes after every service. Say, Jim, this message is so hard. Is it? You know why it's hard for you now? Because you hadn't learned enough to stand up in front of people. I told a guy last night, I said, watch my DVDs, take notes on them. You cannot, you cannot study as fast as you can watch my DVDs and pull out a concordance and look up all the words. You can't study as fast as you can get them off my DVDs. You can't study these things I gave you up here as fast as you can get it off my DVDs, can you? There's no way. I'm not griping if somebody studies my DVDs and repeats them exactly. I don't care. Do it. I've already got them studied out. Not everything. Nobody's going to get everything. These are some heavy-duty verses here. Now, Peter was so up and down. I appreciate Mike saying that to me because I said that's a good title for my message tonight. Let me introduce you to Peter. Matthew 4. These are where Peter comes on the scene. Matthew 4. He was a regular guy that wasn't real spiritually strong when he started, but he had Jesus' favor in Jesus' eye because he was always asking questions. Sometimes he was correcting Jesus. Jesus would say things to him that, look over here in Matthew before, well, I need to introduce him to you first. Look here in Matthew 4. 4. Verse 18. Now this is where Jesus first meets Peter according to Matthew. And Jesus walked, verse 18, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net in the sea. They were fishermen. They were fishers, as it says. And he said unto them, Follow me. By the way, when he said, if any man after me, take, deny, and follow, those are commands. If Jesus is the Jesus of the Old Testament, if he is the I am of the Old Testament, which he said he was, he said before Abraham was, I am, I am the I am God that told, that told Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go and Moses said, well, what if the people say, who is this God? It's been 400 years since we've served that God. He said, you tell them I am has sent me. I exist on my own. So if he's the same one that said, let there be light, was there light when he said, let there be light? Yes, there was. And that's where he said, let the light in. Anytime he gives a command, deny, take, get in the same way with me, utterly contradict yourself, that is not an invitation. That is a command to every man that has an ear to hear. You're not invited to take, deny, and follow. If you're one of God's elect, he hath given you a hearing ear, and the hearing ear and the seeing eye of the Lord made in both of them, when he says, every time he says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear, that's also a command. Here, akuo, A-K-O-U-O, and hear and obey is the word hoop akuo. It means to hear under or be subordinate to. God is not asking you if you would like to hear. He's commanding every one of his elect sheep, now hear this. Do you hear me? Have you ever said that to you, little kid? Do you hear me? Have you ever said that? I've said that to Eric. I can't say it no more. He's too big. <laughs> he might take me and whip me. Now, 
These are not invitations. Deny, take, and follow. Everybody has to have this cross because God commands it. You have to be in the narrow way and you have to suffer tribulation along the way. That's a hard message. You won't hear that in a Baptist church in America anywhere, especially a Southern Baptist or a Primitive Baptist or an Independent Baptist. He goes on to say, so we're talking about Peter. So we're introducing here to Peter. Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren, Simon and called Peter and Andrew his brother. And he said, follow, akulatheo, and it is an imperative command. He knows who his sheep are. He goes up, he's, saying, he's not saying, would you like to follow me, one of my disciples? And they'll say, well, I don't think so. No, there's no choice here. He puts it in their heart to follow him because they're his sheep. Now let's look at another place. Let us look at Mark's introduction of Peter in Mark 3, 16. Mark 3. I'm going to introduce you to Peter, and we're going to kind of go through his life on Wednesday night. And we're going to tie together the things that we've been talking about, how that we have to do, how that we have to eat of the body of Christ, which is not communion. It is the church. We have to partake of the body, and that's the church. And there's one body. It has nothing to do with so-called crackers and grape juice. Mark 3. Here's Mark's introduction to Peter. Mark's gospel was the first gospel that's written. It's believed by all the scholars. Mark 3, verse 16. He's naming off the... Uh, let's start with 13. He goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him calleth unto him whom he would, whom he wills to call to him. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they would be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And that's not given to us. And Simon, he surnamed Peter. And then he goes through here naming the apostles, James, the son of Zebedee, John, the brother of James, he surnamed there them Bernardines, which is the sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Now let's look at Luke's introduction of Peter. Over here in Luke 5. Luke 5. Luke 5 and verse 8. Five and eight. Let's read four. Let's read down to it. This is one of the places where Peter was fishing. And, in, and Luke introduces him that way. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net, one net. I won't let down all the nets, I'll just let down one net. And Jesus had said, let down your nets, plural, there in verse 4. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net broke. They needed all the nets. Shows you how Peter's not paying attention to details, is he? He does that from time to time, just like you and I. I tell people when you're studying Bible, read it slow. When you're reading a word, read it slow. When you're defining it, read it slow. And take time to understand what you're reading. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. Now, they didn't have the Queen Mary ship on the Sea of Galilee. The charismatics will say, I've heard that 
John Abbott and Zenith say, they had ships on the Sea of Galilee the size of the Queen Mary or something like that. Ship, this, this word ship means boats. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. You told me to let down the nets, and I let down one of them, and it broke my net. That's why Peter said, I'm a sinful man. I wouldn't pay any attention to you. Now let's look at John's introduction to Peter. I love John's introduction because it's quite detailed. Over to John, the first chapter. In John, the first chapter, there, John is baptizing in Jordan. And this is a proselyte baptism. It's not a commandment in the Bible for us to be washed in water. It's not there at all. Now, John 1, verse, let's start in verse 35. Again, the next day, this is after John washed Jesus with a proselyte baptism. After John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. He had already said that once. That takes away the sin of the world. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto him, What seek ye? What are you looking for? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where do you dwell? He saith unto him, Come and see. Now the charismatics will say, See, he had a house over there where they could all come to. No, he probably had a tree to live under or a cave. Besides that, he was in Beth Arbor beyond Jordan. I'll just go ahead and tell you this. It goes on to say that he was in Beth Arbor. If I can find Beth Arbor on here. Beyond Jordan. I don't know if I have a detailed map of it. I'll just show you where it is. Over on the other side of Jordan, let me show you on this map over here. Maybe I can... Beth Abra was on this side of Jordan. It was right in here. That was Beth Abra. He was dwelling there, and he told, come and see where I'm staying. The charismatics will say, See, he had a house room enough for all of them to stay in and sleep in. <laughs> That's funny. First of all, he would have been breaking the law. All the land belonged to the original tribes. And if Jesus owned any land as a human, it would have been over here in Judea in the neighborhood of Bethlehem in here. Bethlehem. It would have been in Judea. It was against the law to own land. It was against Jewish law to own land in another tribe area. First of all, he would have been raised up here in Nazareth, and he wouldn't have owned land. That Remember when uh, Tiberius sent out a decree to tax all the world, and Mary was pregnant, heavy with Jesus in her womb, and they had to come down here to Bethlehem to pay their taxes. That's when his birth occurred. You had to go where you were born, and that's the only place you could own land. So when the charismatic says he owns land over here in Beth Abara, that could not have been because he would have owned land over here by his family, but he didn't keep land or anything, didn't have anything. So when they said he owned a house over here in Beth Abara, that's ridiculous. And they said he had a place to keep all the 12 disciples and give them places to bed down. These guys are ignorant. Kenneth Cope, you don't have good sense. Now, let's keep reading. Where dwellest thou? He saith in him, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. They didn't stay all night and sleep in his beds. For it was about the tenth hour, one of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first findeth his own brother Simon 
and saith unto him, he finds, Andrew finds Simon Peter. It is Andrew that introduces Peter to Jesus. That's why I like this account of Peter's uh, entrance into the Scripture. We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought Peter to Jesus. Andrew did. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. It, you'll find that in the 16th chapter of Matthew, where he says, Blessed art thou, Simon. Bar Jonah means son of... Let me erase some of this. Peter was having ups and downs every day of his life. I may just go through and give you an up and then give you a down, okay? He was really on and off. Is anybody else here been on and off? Huh? Is anybody here lost their zeal for Jesus one day and let out a curse word? Stop that. That's all I got to say to you. If you don't, God will beat you. Now, where was I? Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and he first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. When Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. To be a son of is the word, son of is the word bar. Means son of. To be a son of someone, you had to be doing the will of their father of that father to be a called a son of that man. So Simon, Peter, was the son of Jonah because he inherited the office of Jonah. Jonah was called by God in the Old Testament to go preach to Nineveh. Didn't mean to take all this time. Nineveh is here on the Tigris River right about just above Babylon, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. Assyrians were barbarians. They were the worst barbarians that ever lived. They were Caucasians, by the way. And their headquarters was on the, was on the, on the Tigris River, just like Babylon's headquarters was on the Euphrates River, and together, Assyria and Babylon were incorporated into one empire. And, and Jonah was told to go over here to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh. Probably, uh, Jonah didn't want to go. He had heard and knew all about the Assyrians and Nineveh. They were barbaric. They invented all these American Indian tortures. Those were brought to the Americas by the conquistadors, which were those Spanish guys with the hats with a little blade on top of them. And uh, they brought it to America, and the American Indian took that from the conquistadors, and it came from the Assyrians over here. The scalping, bearing a man up to his neck in a desert and, and pouring honey all over his head and putting fire ants on him. That was a Caucasian invention. And to scalp, that's where it came from. Or to tie a man down in the desert with a piece of wet rawhide and pull it tight on his throat and nail it to the ground while he's tied down. And when it would dry, it would strangle him very slowly. That was a, an Assyrian invention. And Jonah evidently knew about these Assyrians, and he hated them. He didn't want God to spare them. He wanted God to kill them. And God sent him over there, and he says, I'm getting on a ship out here, and I'm going out in the Mediterranean. I'm not going to go over there. I don't want God to deliver those barbaric heathens. Well, God brought a storm on that ship. It tossed and turned in the middle of the sea. And Jonah, they said, somebody here is... Is got the wrath of God upon us on the ship. Jonah said, I am the man. Throw me overboard. 
And they threw him over bed and the overboard and the whale swallowed him or the great fish as the Bible put it, swallowed him. And after three days and three nights, the, the great fish vomited him up on the seashore. I heard one of those charismatic preachers say, well, he, I believe he vomited him up right on the, right on the shores of, of Nineveh. Well, if he did, he'd had to vomit him up in the air and shoot him about 650, 700 miles in the air and looking up in the air and say, look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Jonah. <laughs> I just thought, idiots, idiots. They don't even look at a map. <laughs> Jonah, when he was vomited up, probably somewhere in this area, he had to walk all that way over there to preach to Nineveh. And he preached the resurrection to Nineveh. And he was in that belly of that fish three days and three nights, and he was resurrected, and he went over there and preached repentance to him, and that is the gospel, and his being in the belly of the fish is a picture of the gospel. So Peter, when he stood, when he stood in Acts 2, preaching the gospel to these Gentiles from all over the world, he was the son of Jonah because Jonah had the same job that Peter had. Now back to the scripture. One of the two which heard John speak thought, where was I? Blessed art thou, thou art Simon, son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation is a stone. Peter is the word Petros. which means little stone. And in the 16th chapter of Matthew, when, Peter, when Jesus said to Peter and the other apostles, Whom do men say that I am? And Peter said, Some say that you're Elijah come back from the dead. Some say that you're Jeremiah. He said, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was an up day. <laughs> that was one of Peter's up times. Jesus said, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. You're exactly right, Peter. And he was the son of Jonah. I'm going to give you a downtime with him here very shortly. He was up and down all the time. That's... Perhaps the way you feel in your life. Do you ever feel up and down? I'm up today. I feel great. And I love the message Jim preached. But boy, tomorrow when it gets here, the kids are loud. And, and um, don't do that. And you lose your religion. <laughs> right? Well, that's our up and down times. Where was I? And he brought him to Jesus. When Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art... Simon, son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas. In the 16th chapter of Matthew, when the Bible says, Blessed art thou, blessed art thou Simon, son of Jonah. Peter, Petrus means little stone. And Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. The word rock there is the word Petra, which means mountain or large stone. The church was not built on a little stone. It was built on Christ the rock. It has nothing to do with the Catholic church being built upon Peter. That is idiocy. It's not even what the two words mean. Thou art a little stone upon this large Petra. Petra is the title name of the capital city of Edom. They had a, that's just, Edom is just south of Israel. That's the descendants of Esau. And they had a capital city that they called Petra. You had you wind your way in to Petra. It was just a, a little passageway, and it was big stone mountain, and you couldn't get in any other way than walking through that passageway. With, it, only, it was only about two or three people broad, and only two or three people could come in. So if you went in to attack Edom, their capital city was Petra. It was built in, in, within inside of a mountain. All the rooms were built in there. And you would have to, they couldn't have 
repelling hooks. They didn't have them back then. They couldn't climb the mountain. It was a straight shot up. Well, they said, we can't be conquered. And when you read the book of Obadiah, it's one chapter. It's there in the Old Testament. Hosea, Joel, it's Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Obadiah was written to Edom. They said, God said, you think you would dwell among the stars because you dwell on a mountain? And you say in your pride, no one can bring us down. I will bring you down. God sent the Nabataeans in one night. And the Nabataeans caught them while everybody was drunk, including the king. And they walked in and said, you're all under arrest. When you think, it sounds like Babylon, doesn't it? We can't be conquered. And Cyrus says, well, I'll go here north of Babylon. Cyrus, the king of Persia, went north of Babylon, diverted the river into the desert, marched down the riverbed. And they said, we can't be conquered. We got this river going around us, and our walls are 375, 400 feet high. So God had Cyrus divert the river out here, and he just marched down the riverbed. And that night, everybody was drunk. They left the two-leaf gates open, according to the 45th chapter of Isaiah. And they marched up the two-leaf gates. Cyrus in there parting with the vessels of the house of the Lord. Right, Babylon, excuse me, Belshazzar parting with the vessels of the house of God. And Cyrus says, you're under arrest and we're killing you tonight. And they did. When you think you can't be conquered, you can. God can give Bill Gates, he could put him in a car wreck, and give, him, give him a broken neck where he, he can't move around anymore and none of his money will be worth anything. He's going to die anyway before long. Now, let's read Peter's response verse 43 the following the day following jesus would go forth unto galilee and findeth philip and saith unto him follow me philip was of bethsaida the city of andrew and peter philip findeth nathaniel and said to him the same thing as bartholomew another name for bartholomew we have found him of whom moses in the law and the prophets did write Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming unto him and said, I heard what you said. <laughs> I wasn't there, but I'm God, and I hear everything. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile, Nathanael will tell you the truth. Nathanael saith unto him, Which knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw you and I heard you. I am God. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now let's go to a downtime with Peter, okay? Let's go to the 16th chapter of Matthew. Look at a downtime. 16th chapter of Matthew. All right. 16. All right. Matthew 16. We're going to look at Peter's... Uh, he had an uptime in, time in this chapter, and he also had a downtime. The uptime was when he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's when he said in verse 14, Some say that you're... John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah. And one of the prophets, he said to them, But whom do you say that I am? Peter said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's when Jesus said, You're blessed, Simon bar Jonah, there in verse 17. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. 
And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, thou art Petros, a little stone, and upon this Petra, which is me, big stone, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. What does that mean? The gates of a city were the strongest parts of a city that have a gate on the east side of the city. And here's the, here's the walls of the city, like so. And everywhere they had a gate, it was like a small fortress. It was the last thing to come down. I preached a message, a couple of three messages years ago on the gates of a city. The gates of hell will not prevail, cannot stand up under the charge of this Christ, the Son of the living God. The last thing would come down when there'd be an attack. Each gate would have something they would sell there. It was like a small city hall. They traded. They had contracts there. You'd see sheep at one gate. They'd sell dung at this gate over here. It would be called a dung gate. They would have a fish gate. And the fish gate was on the seaside of Jerusalem. In fact, the Bible says in, I believe it's Zephaniah, that when, when Nebuchadnezzar came down to attack Jerusalem, they came in the fish gate, which is on the east, on the on the seaside of Jerusalem, which would be the Mediterranean side. There's a reason for all this. Now, after Jesus says, The gates of hell will not prevail, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He, he didn't mean that he had a key like the Pope wearing it on his side. The keys to the kingdom was what opened the door. What opened the door was the gospel. I'm not going to go into that greatly. The gospel is the key to the kingdom. And Peter preached that to the, he preached it to the Jews at Acts 2 and preached it to the Gentiles in Acts 10. And we have the keys. It is the gospel. We preach it to people and that's the keys of the kingdom. It's not a literal set of keys. You can look up. I've got a book called the, uh, it's the keys that the Pope holds supposedly, that gets people into heaven. I'm sorry they got that messed up. Peter was not the first pope. Now, look down here in verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem. Now, Peter's going to have a downtime right here. He just had an uptime. And suffered many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's telling, I got to be killed and raised the third day. Peter has his ideas about this. It's kind of like Peter has his ideas about saying to this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, that we talked about the other night. Peter said, You killed to kill a fig tree because it was against you us all to kill fig trees. And Jesus said, I'm God, have faith in God. That was a downtime for Peter. He's always being corrected by Jesus. Peter took Jesus and began to rebuke Jesus, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. That's really funny. Because Jesus has to tell him, You're going to deny me three times. And Jesus says, I'll never deny you. Deny me contradict. You realize how comical that is when he says that? Don't tell me I'll contradict you. I'll never do that. He's contradicting him while he's saying that. So this is one of Peter's down times. He is like you and I. He had a hard time keeping his mind on the words of Jesus and believing Jesus about everything he says. Do you believe everything Jesus says? Do you believe he works all things after the counsel of his own will? Do you believe in everything give thanks? That is his words. Not red letters. It's Paul writing down the inspired word of God which comes from Jesus. Do you actually believe that? When things get real bad, you say, do you say, oh, what am I going to do about this? And do you say, God has ordained this? Can you calmly say that in the quietness of your mind? I know most of you can't. 
you're going to have to get old like me to start being able to say that. I know that. Now, you can tell me you've got it together at 30 or 35 or 40 or 45. I know better because, boy, I didn't have it together then. I didn't have it together at 55 and 60 when this ministry had been going 10 or 12 years. God has had to really deal with me to learn to believe the message I preach that he works all things after his own counsel. And we need to learn to thank God no matter what's going on in our lives. Sitting around stressing out over the will of God that's going on, it don't make sense to me anymore. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. They're not going to kill you. You're going to take hold and be the king of the world, for it's over with. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Next time you start contradicting the word of God, when he says, Lo, I am with you all the way to the end of the world, you say, well, how's he with me now? He's not fixing this. He's not supposed to fix it to your liking. Thou art an offense unto me. Why was he Satan? Huh? What? I can't hear you. He, he was an adversary. He was an adversary. Satan, Satanas, means an adversary. Have you ever corrected Jesus about what he's doing in your life? Huh? Have you ever argued with anything and got angry and thought, this ain't going the way I want it to go? You kids, hush. <laughs> Are you supposed to correct them? Yes. Are you to correct them in anger? No. That's hard, isn't it? You're supposed to correct them and say, honey, I love you, and I have to spank you. Mommy loves you. Daddy loves you. And we hate to have to do this. If you get old enough, you'll learn that. They, I keep saying it to Eric. They're just boys. They're supposed to do that. They're supposed to mess up and goof up and not make the right grades at times. And sometimes they do. It's supposed to be that way. Well, they, they should do what I tell them to do. Well, let them, we let them grow up a few years maybe 15 or 20, okay? I am so patient with kids nowadays. I guess I've always been to a degree. I know they're innocent. I know they're going to grow up to be sinners soon enough, right? So Peter is like us. He has times he wants to correct Jesus about his words, even though Jesus said, He's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. If it's according to the good pleasure of his will, why don't we just believe him? If God would step down out of the sky while you're having a hard time say look this is of me would that help you huh would that help well let me tell you a secret he's already done that he's just not putting it up a loud sound system but he said it in here I do all things. I've declared the end from the beginning, from ancient times. Everything that's not happening in your life, including the things that you don't like, like Peter. Whew. Peter sure reminds me of us, doesn't he, you? Uh, but by the time he got old, he was ready to pay with his life. And that will happen to you, too. Now, gosh, where did I go? Look at Matthew 14. Matthew 14. Here's another up and down time with Peter. <laughs> Peter, boy, he has, he has a hard time, doesn't he? Matthew 14 and verse 22. And straightway or immediately, Jesus constrained his 
disciples, constrained. Anankazo means to necessitate or compel his apostles to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. When the evening was come, he was there alone. And the ship was in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. For the wind was contrary, was blowing real hard. And in the fourth watch of the night, wow! Jesus went unto them walking on the water, walking on the sea. It was the fourth watch. The apostles were terrified to be on the sea in the middle of the night. You had four watches. Four watches. You had the evening watch. The apostles and everybody at large thought the sea was full of demons. They thought the whales were the were the big demons, and there was a they thought there was a a gate to hell at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. That was the common consensus of the superstition of the world. And they said, that's why Jonah said, out of the belly of hell cried I, because they said there was a gate into hell at the bottom of the Mediterranean. And so here it is, middle of the night, from 3 to 6 in the evening. It's not, excuse me, not 3 to 6. Since 6 to 9 was the evening watch, That was the first watch. Number two was the midnight watch. That was from 9 to 12. Midnight watch. And then you had the third watch of the night was from 12 to 3 in the morning. That was the cock crow watch. And boy, we got a lot to say about that. Cock crow watch. I couldn't understand how the cock could crow here and here. Cock crow sounded like a rooster. Da da da. They used some kind of trumpet, would sound it in the street, and say something along the lines of what the English did back in the 1600s. Twelve o'clock and all is well. They didn't say that. Some along that line. Uh, evening watch ends and or midnight watch ends and cockroach watch begins. And then they would do that again about three. And I couldn't understand when I was young, how could Peter hear a rooster crow? That was one of his down times. When Jesus said before the cock crow twice, once at 12 and once at three. And Peter was used to hearing the cock crow come into being when somebody would sound the watch. He was used to hearing that. So evidently, he wasn't paying attention when Jesus said, before the cock crow twice over a three-hour period, you're going to deny me three times. He wasn't thinking. But when he heard that cock crow in one of his down times like we have, he heard it and he broke down and began to weep because he had done exactly what Jesus said. That's one of his down times. He was up and down and up and down. He's our, one of our best examples in the Bible to try to emulate. One thing about Peter, he was bold. People always think of Peter standing outside Pilate's praetorium, waiting for the soldiers to take him in the next day and take Jesus in the next day. Peter was there denying Christ, but let me ask you this, where were the other apostles they wasn't even there to deny him they had run away and were hiding so let's don't give him so much grief okay they weren't willing to even be there and the fact that he kept moving in close and warming his hands by the fire woman said you're one of his he said 
blankety blank, I know him not. But he stayed there warming his hands. He cursed. And he warmed his hands. But he didn't go away. And he moved closer as the night went on. He had more guts than the rest of the apostles. It was a down-up time, you know. Kind of mixture of the two. Now, where was I? 14. 22. 22. He constrains his disciples to get into a ship at the fourth watch. They were terrified at the fourth watch of the night to go on the Sea of Galilee. Master, you don't mean that, do you? But they did. And the fourth watch was from three in the morning to six. And it was dark, and they were scared out there, and he comes walking on water up to them. Whew. And they believed in demons. They believed in Leviathan. Leviathan, they said, was a sea monster that lived in the deep. It was probably whales, and they thought they were terrified, and they terrifying, and it scared them, and they didn't want to see them. And they believed there was all kinds of demons that lived in the Mediterranean that rose up out of the Mediterranean Sea. Be thou cast into the sea. Where was I? And in the fourth watch of the night, he's the one that told them to get into the boat and go out into the sea. Well, that took a lot of guts to do that. With all the superstition that's going on, there were demons in the sea, and there was a Leviathan out there who would get them. In the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. This is first mentioned over in Job, the ninth chapter. Look at Job, ninth chapter. Only a living God can walk on water and defy buoyancy of water, defy the laws of nature, Job. How much time did I have? Oh, goodness, I'm not even getting started on Peter. Job 9, this will tell you who Jesus is, Job 9. Job 9, and let's start reading here. Uh, this is talking about God. Job answered and said, I know it is of a truth, in verse 1, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, if he wants to argue with God, he can answer him one of a thousand questions. Man doesn't have any answers from God. God is wise in heart and mighty in strength who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered, which removeth mountains. How's that if you'll say to this mountain, be thou removed? Governments and kingdoms, and they know not, which overturneth them in anger. Why would he overturn a mountain in anger? Because a mountain was a capital city, a ruling city of an empire, which shaketh the earth out of her place and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it doesn't rise, and sealeth up the stars where they can't be seen, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treads upon the waves of the sea. That's God. So this is talking about when God comes to the earth, he's going to walk on water. And it goes on which maketh Arcturus and Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Now go back over here. Walking on the sea, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. They were really superstitious. They didn't say it's a pneuma. The word spirit, the common word is P-N-E-U-M-A, which means breath. They said it is a phantasm, which is a demon. The apostles called Jesus a demon walking on water. 
That's how superstitious they were. They're going to have to overcome their culturally enhanced way of thinking. They think he's a demon. We get our word fantasy from that. A fantasy is an imagination in it, isn't it? They said it's a phantasm. It's a demon. He's going to get us. Why did we listen to him come out here? But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it's just me. Be not afraid. Isn't that great? It's just me. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come to you that I can walk on the water. Here's another downtime with Peter. I think Peter's funny. Don't y'all? He is so, his faith is so up and down. And he has a boldness when it comes to time. You know what? I believe Jesus picked out Peter. He even took him up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. Peter was the one that always looked like us. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, if it's really you, bid me to come to thee on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But he began to look around at the storm, just like we do in our lives. It's all going to destroy me. And then he started sinking. And then he said the words that we have to say to Jesus. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. I'm going to perish. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith. That's our problem. O ye of oligos. They couldn't have had much faith. They believe there's demons out there in the sea. Holy God's pistis, puny faith. He's always saying that to the apostles. These aren't old men. These are young kids. For some reason, people, every time they draw Jesus with the apostles, they bought to draw a bunch of old men walking around a cornfield with Jesus who's 30 years old. And John has to live at least to 96 A.D. because he's going to write the book of Revelation 96 A.D. 60 years later, 63 years later. John is not an old man. He's a kid. And so is Peter. You're not a fisherman, a hard, hard job if you're an old man in that damn time. Fishing was hard. Pulling all those fish in, separating. It was a long day. They had to work all day hard. Peter is so much like us, isn't he? Oh, we're like him. We're weak. Something else. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, said, O oh, thou of little faith, and when they were come into the ship, the wind stopped. He always has this tendency to stop the storm. You know how he stops the storm in our life, making us to believe after so long a year's that he's doing everything. He's creating evil in our life for our good. He's putting us under pressure for our good so we will learn he's in charge, we're not. Am I out of time? Yes. I'm going to come back and we're going to keep dealing with Peter. To me, he's a comical character in the Bible. Lord, can I come to you? Let me walk on water. Come on. But there's too much storm around me. Lord, save me, I perish. Sounds like us, doesn't it? I thought you were going to be with me, Lord. I'm going to come back to Peter next week. We'll keep talking about him because he's truly an amazing person. Sometimes he is so strong. He has times where he is powerful, and sometimes he's so weak. Does that sound like you? It is. If you get old enough, you'll get to where you don't care. Because if you care, if I cared, what am I going to do? Spend the next 10 or 12 years of my life caring about me? When it's not going to matter, it's going to be over with before long. 
and it may be over with, with you before long. You may die. God may kill you in a car wreck. I'm going to come back and we're going to talk more about Peter and these real powerful verses. You see, everything has a meaning. When Jesus commanded to get in the ship in the middle of the morning watch, they were scared out of their minds. Said, we told you there's a, there were spooks out here. See, I knew there were some demons. Look at that. There comes one. Jesus said, it's me. It's nobody but me. Isn't that? That's what he's trying to say to us. That's what he's saying to us. It's just me. When all your life falls apart, it's me. I'm doing it. I sent these winds. I'm the one that sends the earthquakes. And you think you're in the middle of the earthquake and I can't deliver you. I will. If he has to deliver us in death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God help us to learn that we're like Peter. We, we have a hard time getting a hold of things, getting a hold of your word, strengthen the flock, cause them to understand that you're in charge and you're not going to leave us nor forsake us till the end of the world. You've helped convince me of, you've convinced me of that. And Lord, I've still got some further to go. Strengthen us. Fight our battles for us. And there we'll be there just like they were for Peter. We'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to keep on talking about Peter. Boy, he's got a lot of things going on in the Bible. We need to talk about...